Good evening. It's now seven o'clock and I would like to start the meeting of Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I'd like to remind everyone present that the meeting is being live streamed to the Council's online webcast channel. I also like to remind members and officers to turn their microphones off when they're not speaking. I will give everyone an opportunity to speak at the end of each item. Can I ask for all mobile phones to be turned off and electronic devices to be on silent during the meeting? I would like to welcome the new co-opt member, Neil Woodbridge, for Thorough Lifestyle Solutions. <laughs> no, uh, item one, apologies for absence. I have received an apology from Kim James for this evening's meeting. No others at all? No more apologies, Chair. Okay, item two. I move that minutes of health and wellbeing and overview scrutiny held on the 4th of March 2021 to be approved as a correct record. Does any member have any comments on the minutes? No comments? Okay, we'll, we'll move that as approved. That's okay. Item three, urgent items of business. I've not agreed to any items of urgent business. Item four, declarations of interest. Does anyone wish to declare any interest, uh, declaration of interest? Uh, Neil, right. Neil Woodbridge. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am the Chief Executive of Thorough Lifestyle Solution, and on item one, you're talking about the closure of Bell House. Currently, due to COVID, we're leasing that property temporarily off the council, so uh, it's not necessarily a conflict, but just to be transparent, that is the relationship that we have with that building. Thank you, Neil. Okay, item five, <coughs> uh, items raised by Health Watch. As Kim James has sent her apologies, there's no items to be raised. Item six, COVID update. Can I ask Joe Bullbent to present this item, please? Yes, Chair, let me just share my screen with you. Can you see that? Yes, Joe, thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, so, the current picture we have uh, of COVID in Thurrock, um, you can see the comparison with our um, neighbouring local authorities. We've got currently one of the lowest um, rates per 100,000 population, not just among our neighbours, but actually in the country, we're 136th out of 149 upper tier local authorities. Uh, and you can see it's our positivity rate is also um, is very low uh, and lower than it has been for some time. In terms of how that compares uh, to what we've had previously, um, if you look on the, the graph on the right here, the black line is the positivity rate. Uh, you can see that the positivity rate has been very low um, for some time and has increased slightly just in the past couple of weeks. So we've seen our case numbers uptick in the past couple of weeks, but it's a very shallow uptick um, and our rates are around 25 per 100,000 at the moment. And if you compare that with the rates we had back in January, that's obviously uh, a very low rate indeed. Um, this is the current picture of the latest seven day data and the age distribution of cases just just for interest. So you can see that the majority of cases now are in the under 40s. So uh, in the cohorts that have either not been vaccinated or only had one vaccination, probably up till this point. Um, and, and you can see here that around half of our cases now are the Delta variant, with the other half being the Alpha variant or Kent variant, as it was called previously. The proportion of um, cases that are of the Delta variant are increasing um, in line with the rest of the country, but actually our Delta variant rates haven't increased as sharply as, as a lot of other areas in the country yet. 
this is the um, the bed occupancy in BTUH. You can see we actually had a period where there were no uh, COVID patients in, in the hospital at all, and there's very low numbers now. Um, no one on mechanical ventilation and very low numbers in the hospital. And I think actually today there's, we're back to only one, one patient. So this is the, the geographical distribution. This is where it was um, uh, some months ago. And if we sort of move forward in time, oh, this is where we are now. So around half of our LSOAs uh, have uh, no um, infections at all. And those who do only have between one and nine cases in each unique postcode. We do have three schools in live outbreak. Um, but no care homes uh, with any cases at all. And it's been it's been some time since we've had a case associated with a care home. And the last one was actually a visitor, not a resident or a member of staff. So, so this is really positive. And you can see these big white areas on the map um, compare favourably to where we were a couple of months ago. So moving to vaccinations, this is the data on vaccinations. Um, you can see that for the over 70s, over 90% of our um of our community <laughs> now had two doses of the vaccination and for the over 50s we're now up to 69 percent having two doses um, the vaccinations are now being rolled out to over 21s uh and so and then as you'll have seen in the media there is a, a speeding up of the vaccination program over the next four weeks and i believe that our our nhs colleagues uh, not this weekend but the weekend after are planning a big weekend of vaccinations and a real push to get as many vaccinations done that weekend as possible because as you all know one of the best defences we've got against the Delta variant that's on the rise across the country is to increase the vaccination rates. Um, you'll see also as well that our clinically extremely vulnerable patients have high uptake of the vaccination as well and 75 percent so three quarters of our NHS and social care staff have now had two doses of the vaccine. And um, just in terms of other cohorts we're focusing on, we are continuing our work with uh, marginalised groups. Um, over this week, we've got uh, the three council traveller sites being visited by mobile vaccination um, teams. And we've got our second visit to Buckles Lane. The first time we went to Buckles Lane, we had over 300 vaccinations delivered in one day. So that's really positive. We've also been working with um, services that support the homeless, um, asylum seekers, etc. Um, we've also done some analysis of areas, geographical areas within the borough where uh, uptake has been lower and we've got a mobile vaccination team going out to Averley and also to uh, a women's group um, that's based in Tilbury over the next uh, week. Um, so so we're, we're doing the, the mainstream vaccination through the NHS but we're doing a lot of targeted work as well to really get these vaccine numbers up. Just a word about the comms uh, that we've got going on and we've been working uh, very closely with our comms team as ever. So the comms messages are currently focusing on urging people to continue to follow the current government guidance to get their vaccination when invited to do so. And we're using the e-newsletter and also a lot of social media activity. And you can just see here an example of some of the social media posts that the comms team have been sharing recently. And you can see they're aiming at a much uh, at a younger uh, group within the community, including uh, secondary school children. Um, we're planning to do some communications with businesses via Business Buzz. Um, and our comms team have also been doing some easy, easy read social media posts to support the vaccine outreach that, that I mentioned before. We've also now had the findings of some vaccine hesitancy research this week um, that we commissioned. Uh, and we're going to use those to craft some communications next week. And we've also updated our vaccination page with the findings from that research. So, so we've got a much better understanding now of the concerns that people who haven't yet had a vaccination have uh, and the information that they might need to help them um, make the decision to get vaccinated. So in conclusion, our positivity rates are increasing slightly over recent weeks, but do remain low compared to the rest of the country. The number of PCR tests that are being done has remained fairly constant uh, at just around just over the 600 mark. Um, LFD tests are the majority of tests, um, about 10,000 of those recorded in the last week. The geographic distribution of cases has remained broadly similar 
in recent days and around half of our lower super output areas, so small geographical areas, are seeing no positive test results in the past two weeks, which is very positive. Uh, COVID bed usage is very low in BTUH, and as I mentioned, we continue to promote uh, vaccine uptake. Um, the public health team continues uh, with the surveillance of COVID and particularly focusing on the Delta variant at the moment. And we've also started enhanced contact tracing. So that's um, contact tracing, speaking to cases, not just about who they may have come into contact with when they were infectious, but also looking backwards to try and identify if there are hot spots where people got, um, where a number of people may have contracted their infection in the first place. So we are, we're doing all we can. And that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joe. Um, just a couple of questions on there, Joe. Uh, we've got the vaccination uh, figures on now. Are we likely, actually, this may I see Robert Hall is, has joined us as well. Um, are we likely to see one of those events in our area where we open up the vaccination process to, um, I guess that goes on if we've got leftovers or wastage to cut down on that. Have we got any wastage numbers or leftover numbers of vaccines at the moment? I don't know, but uh, Ruffin might be able to answer that. So, uh, Chair, if, if I may come, to, um, come into this. Um, so we did a piece of work about three weeks ago looking at the wastage numbers of vaccines. Um, and our vaccine wasted is 0.08% um, to the 114,000 or 100,000-odd um, doses that's been delivered, so it's very, very minimal wastage, yeah. and some of the wastage could be attributed to the way um, where, where it came um, compromised when it was delivered. Um, yeah. So I think I think our, our wastage numbers are very, very good. No, that, that's brilliant to hear. Thank you, Rahul. Um, one of the questions, Joe, was regarding testing. I did see that we were sort of um, really high peak was in New Year. Uh, I think you said it was over 2,000. I think it was you put up there. And we're now down to 630 PCR tests. Um, wouldn't we like, with the Delta variant now being around in, in Farrakh, are we going to be pushing on for more PCR tests to be done? So PCR testing is used for symptomatic um, people, so people we're trying to diagnose who, who have symptoms. So that's kind of why it's stayed at that that level, the asymptomatic testing is the LFD testing. Um, so we have got a lot more of that going on. I mean, we we have a lot more capacity for PCR testing within the borough. <coughs> Excuse me. Should we need it? So if our case numbers do go, we do have that capacity, um, and, and those testing sites that we've got will remain for the coming months. And that's good to hear that they're going to stay with us. Um, I'd, I guess I'd like to see them being used more. Uh, I know that the one in Coronham is generally quite empty at the moment. Um, I guess that is because people are not having the symptoms and obviously they're also using the lateral flow test a lot more now, um, going by the numbers that you've shown. Um, I'll open up to the rest of the, the committee. Uh, Councillor Fish. Um, <clears throat> if we'd held this meeting last September, we would have had a very similar picture, I think, in terms of cases um, and uh, you know, it would have been a pretty um, sort of good picture, really, very positive. Move forward to a couple of months to December, January, it was horrendous. So are we saying now then that um, we don't expect that kind of situation to happen, even though the trend is upwards, and as we know from the rest of the country, once that trend goes upwards, it continues upwards. Are we saying now because of the vaccines, we aren't going to get a similar situation? Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, that's a very good question. And you're absolutely right that this is what the position that was seen sort of in the autumn going into the winter last year. But you're also right that the vaccination programme puts us in a very different position now. So, so the data we have on the vaccines, uh, we know that the protection after two doses is really quite high. It's not 100 percent, but it is good protection against the Delta variant. So, so as you'll have seen in the in the national media, the reason for pushing back the final stage of the roadmap essentially is to give that space to roll out the vaccine to another nine million people across England. And that, you know, so so we will have fewer a much smaller cohort that are susceptible um, to the infection going forward.
Thank you, Joe. Any other questions from the floor? Councillor Polly. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for uh, accepting me into your committee. Uh, just the question as regarding the vaccine, the, the, the actual makeup and the design of the vaccine, as I understand it, especially with the Pfizer, is that it, it can be adaptable. So if Delta does start to escalate to the numbers that we saw, as Councillor Fish alluded to last winter, that they can restructure that va vaccine to be more targeted towards the Delta variant. Is that correct in my understanding? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, you are correct. So there is a lot of work going on across the pharmaceutical industry um, to develop um, modified strains of the vaccine and um, what um, what I suspect we'll end up with eventually is probably a, a mixture of strains in one vaccine um, a bit like we have in the flu vaccine um, so, so work is going on on that at the moment we don't have it at the moment but you're right the vaccines are quite adaptable to uh, to the viral strains Thank you very much. That's good to know because obviously, although we, uh, I absolutely agree, the vaccination program has been amazing, and we we can, as as well as the NHS input, and we can only thank our volunteers because without those, they are our delivery vehicle. So we really need to acknowledge all the hard work that the volunteers have done at these vaccination centres. But uh, but it's good that. We, we're not standing still. The, the thinking is still behind as we go into winter pressures. We, in Thurrock particularly, we, we have a demographic that is, has respiratory problems. COPD is, is quite a, a high percentage of older people's ailments. So these winter pressures that will come with or without variants are, are already in the thinking now. So we're going to not be reactive to situations. We are taking um, actions now to, to be preventative uh, and take some of the pressures off of those very precious acute beds. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I, I know it's become a rather a common trend to actually praise our vaccination team and the volunteers that do it. I think all the feedback we ever had is how jolly the experience is for people in the local community that go and have it. So I definitely echo your your thanks on that. Okay, brilliant. Any any other? Uh, say, Neil Woodbridge. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, just to say um, thank you to the CCG colleagues for helping us ensure that the disabled people we support, some of whom are the most vulnerable, have had their vaccinations. We've had a pretty successful. Um, turnout, etc., in support with that. But just one question, I might have missed it on the statistics, that sort of, in terms of trying to get everybody vaccinated, we, we are still struggling slightly in some of the caring professions where there's a hard core of people from the black and minority ethnic community who are still resisting. Is there a strategy for that? And is there ways in which we could help to encourage people? Or is that not the case anymore, that that particular community are, are, are more difficult? Some people in there are not agreeing to have the vaccine. Joe, would you like to go uh, on that? Oh, well. Yes, so the research we've done around vaccine hesitancy um, has, uh, and the surveillance that we've been doing has shown that actually it's quite hard to generalise across different ethnic groups. So we have found that um, some of our ethnic groups, for example, which we thought had lower uptake initially, so our black African community, for example, those in the older age groups there have had much lower uptake but in the younger age groups it's been much higher but then in some other ethnic groups the opposite pattern has been seen so actually it's it's quite hard to generalize i think across ethnic groups what we do know is that there are uh, communities within Thurrock uh, where there are um, quite a lot high number of people who haven't yet had the vaccination. So what we've done is some analysis uh, to pinpoint which geographical areas, as well as looking at cohorts on the basis of ethnicity, uh, vulnerability, that kind of thing. So we're taking a multi-pronged approach to this to try and uh, to try and reach as many people as possible. The research that we've done has been really helpful in helping us understand the nuances of why people are hesitant about vaccines. So we know now that um, a lot of people are still concerned about the rapidity in which the vaccines were developed. Uh, and so we need to 
um, get information to them about actually this doesn't mean that safety has and cut, corners have been cut and that safety has been compromised. It just means it was done in a different way. Um, there's also been concerns, for example, among younger people around fertility. There's been a lot of misinformation on social media around that. So a lot of our messages as well need to be sort of quite, I think, crafted quite carefully and targeted through our social media messaging and through our face to face communications to really understand what people's concerns are. And I think people have genuine concerns and it's that there's so much information out there and so much misinformation as well. People genuinely have been quite confused, I think about some of this so so we've now we have done a lot of work to try and help people understand we've got um the web page on the council website that's a synthesis of some of the information that we know is the sort of information that people in thorough are wanting so so we're doing what we can to try and help people understand the, the vaccine uh, development process and the safety and their particular circumstance better thank you joe neil is was that helpful for you that answer very helpful, thank you, Chair. Neil, in your opinion, obviously you're seeing this on right in front of you. What sort of explanations and reasons are they giving you personally? Exactly like just was described, actually. Uh, our younger staff were resistant at first, particularly people that were trying for families. So the younger women in particular were not keen to have a vaccine at first. We've done a lot of work and some of the information that's come out from the council website and some of the guys on the screen there has been very useful. Uh, social media has been a nightmare. I mean, everybody knows that. They've got lots of misinformation. And then for, there is a cohort, a tiny cohort, for whom it's a religious thing. And, and they're saying to us that, that, that God will make the decision they don't need the vaccine. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's hard as people say. You don't want to generalise. You have to respect people's opinions. But the truth is that that's what's, be, that's what's being said. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's sad to hear that, but it's also good to hear that, you know, the information on the council website is, is helping and being used for that. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Rahul, for your, for your report. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to item seven, adult social care provider services transformation. This report can be found on pages 21 to 38 of the agenda. Can I ask Ian Wake to present this item, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, if I kick off, and I've got Dawn Shepherd here, who's a strategic lead um, for our adult social care provider services, who will maybe be able to help me out on if you have any very detailed questions in terms, in terms of the services. Um, so the paper sets out proposals to transform our adult social care provider services division. Um, I, I will stress that despite what um, has been reported um, on social media and uh, in various other sources, these are proposals at the moment, no decision has been made. This is a cabinet decision and the paper invites committee to comment on the proposals as part of the normal consultation process that we are, are going through. Um, th there are three proposals. Um, the first is to restructure and transform the way that we provide care to create um, self-directed teams that um, I firmly believe will improve um, outcomes for residents and for staff as well actually. The second is about transformation of our daycare services and the third is a proposal to decommission our Meals on Wheels service and action to look to provide this service through other mechanisms. Um, if I take um, each in turn, um, so the, the major proposal is about the transformation and restructure of the way that we um, provide um, home care. Um, so just some history, um, uh, home care, um, as well, Thurrock Council as provider of last resort um, has to step in when um, our external home care providers fail. Most of our home care is provided by the private sector, um, but a few years ago we had several home care providers actually go bankrupt and hand the kind of their contracts back to us and so we took their staff in-house uh, uh, and this is how this certainly part of this division has been formed. Um, we've at, at, at the point of doing that um, inherited um, the traditional time and task model of how we deliver domiciliary care uh, and that is basically that care is specified in advance usually by a commissioner following an assessment um, and then um, that care is delivered and that care is delivered in a time and task way such that everyone gets exactly the same care each day and they often have different people delivering the care uh, and that in my view is, is a, a old-fashioned and outdated and ineffective way um, of delivering care um, to residents. 
Um, over the last two years, we've been piloting a, a much newer and I think much or far superior uh, model through what's called our wellbeing teams. Um, so this is where we set up a, a, a team of, of self-directed um, carers. Um, uh, they're based at sub-locality level uh, and they work I I in a very different way, really based on the Birdsog model of delivering care. Um, so their aim is to develop long-term care relationships with the people that they care for, to provide care continuity, so to really move away from that time and task, task approach to a much more strength and assets based approach and a much more bespoke approach. So rather than everyone getting exactly the same care each day, no matter how they're feeling, that care flexes depending on the needs of that person during the day and that needs, needs of that person over time. Um, it's much better for staff as well. We are trusting staff to make decisions. It provides a, a better career structure and some status um, to staff and we believe um, that it will help with staff retention moving forward. Certainly, <clears throat> having spoken to the, the wellbeing team staff, uh, it's absolutely clear to me that they um, far prefer working uh, in this much more trusted and bespoke way than that they ever did um, working in a traditional dom care way. Um, in terms of the evaluation of the wellbeing teams, it, we've evaluated uh, over the last year, we're running the data again for the last 12 months. I was astonished at the difference in outcomes. So we compared those cared for by a wellbeing team compared to those cared for by traditional provider services and our external providers. And we found a sevenfold reduction in GP usage in terms of clients cared for by the wellbeing teams compared to standard care and a threefold reduction in hospital admissions. And when people did go into hospital, we found that they, the, the length of stay was much shorter. So the outcomes, uh, I think, speak for themselves. Um, the second service is about transforming our daycare provision. Historically, we provided daycare on three sites, um, Cromwell Road, which has always been the main site, Kynet Court, which is a sheltered housing scheme, um, but where we've kind of um, piggybacked uh, on that, that scheme and used their communal lounges um, to provide daycare for external visitors. And then finally, um, through a small shop at Bell House, um, the residents at Kynet Court um, have never been particularly happy that their communal lounge has been used for this purpose. And Bell Shop, sorry, Bell House, um, the shop in South Huntington, um, has poor natural light, no outside space and poor facilities and, and is not really fit for providing a high quality service. So um, the proposal is that, that when we reopen, obviously these services have been closed for COVID, we hope to reopen in September, um, dependent on the government roadmap and what happens along the lines of what Joe has been just been describing. But the proposal would be to consolidate all of daycare services on the main site at Cromwell Road. Um, we believe that in doing this, we can provide a much more comprehensive service. We can open for longer, we can open in the evenings, we can open at weekends, and we will continue to be able to provide um, some of the outreach services that we've provided during COVID that have been tremendously popular with, with some residents because not everyone wants to go to, a, to actually a, a day centre for their care. So again, a much more bespoke service. Um, the final element is the Meals on Wheels. Um, we inherited this service um, from a charity, um, the RVS. Um, they handed the contract back to us in 2019. Thurrock is one of only a handful of services left operating by local authorities and, and Demand for the service has declined year on year. In fact, there's been a 26% decline over the last six years, and we currently only have about 90 service users left. The service is heavily subsidised at about £190,000 per annum, and um, we find it difficult to continue to justify providing the service in this way. Um, there are a range of alternatives. I think that's why it's declined in popularity. Um, as you all know, over the last few years, a range of companies now provide services, deliver um, uh, ready meals to homes. Um, you can buy um, ready meals in the supermarket and get those delivered as well. Um, we are in discussion um, with the service manager to turn this service into a microenterprise. I think as a microenterprise, it would be much better delivered in terms of the grassroots um, element to it. And we've got a really, really strong track record in terms of supporting them developing microenterprises in Thurrock. As part of the transition, we will, of course, assess every service user to whom we currently provide the service to make sure that there are alternatives 
um, available to you. I'll stop there, Dawn. I don't know whether you wanted to add anything um, to that or I think I've missed anything out. <clears throat> I think you covered everything, Ian. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say that, you know, despite, like Ian, despite the, the media that you've seen recently, um, it was based on nothing more than notes. This does not represent what we see in the media, does not represent this report. This is the first time this report has come to us to be reviewed and to be looked at. Um, I have invited uh, Councillor Hoolan to, to join us tonight as portfolio holder um, to add any other comments that she'd like before we open up to questions to say, see if uh, the Councillor would like to speak. Thank you, Chair. It's very kind. Um, I, the, I've read this report through and through and I actually find it to be very positive. Well, I looked and researched on the Burtzok model that the new health and well-being teams are based around and it allows people that are receiving care to have much better control for the team to have better understanding of individual needs. They can connect because they're in smaller groups locally. They can connect them to other people and they have the ability within their their line of management to make changes rather than the full, uh, very lengthy referral system that there can be. And I've got a friend that's recently been diagnosed with a motor neuron disease and she's gradually seeing her ability to care for herself being eroded. And I kind of use her and talk to her and kind of benchmark things with her. And I got her to have a read and she thought it was absolutely fantastic. She said that she wished that was available where she lived and going forward it would give her not only the continuity but the dignity that she wants to try and keep within her care when, because she will have made friends with the people that are within her team. So for me, this is about improving outcomes and health and well-being. And as we saw, it stops people going to the doctor. It stops them having to go into hospital. It's so much better. The um, care provision, the daycare provision, is not disappearing. We're improving it. I couldn't think of anything worse, if I'm honest, than having to have my father or my mother sitting in a shop looking at a loading bay instead of a garden and um, a main road and artificial lighting. It, it's wrong in a modern 21st century offer, it's wrong. The uh, social club is a personal social club for Kynock residents. We've seen them stressed, unhappy, argumentative, not getting on. How is that good for their health and well-being? They want their social club back. It's time to listen to them because that's what we should do with all people that need our care, and, and talk to the other users who also aren't necessarily getting a great experience because they know they're not wanted there, and combine it into one day centre where we've got a much better offer. We, we, can, we can cover, evening cover, for, for those needing respite, for 24-hour carers. It means that they'd actually maybe be able to go out with their friends knowing their loved one is well looked after, and socialise with them in an evening or a weekend because their friends are working through the week and they can't do that through the day. And more activities, a garden, it's, it's so much better for the health and well-being. I don't understand why there has been so much derogatory media around this. I, I just don't understand it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Ian, just coming back, back to yourself. Reading this report, one thing that strikes me is that actually respite is actually going to be extended because there's going to be an option of evening sessions as well once this is all moved to Common Road. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. So um, if you want respite, if you just want it during the daytime, you might actually need it during the evening. And so this is very much around our transformation aims in terms of providing more bespoke and flexible services. And by rationalising the care on one site, we save uh, money on buildings, but we can actually then invest um, to deliver a, a, a better and more comprehensive service in, in terms of daycare and, um, and respite. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
thank you. Um, I mean, also, there's also going to be concerns about the travel and, and that sort of side of it with the minibuses that we've got. Um, I do know from not personal experience, but by residents that have contacted me this week at Kennet Court, they're more than happy that the uh, daycare service may be removed because they can get their, their haul back, um, which they're all really looking forward to after lockdown as well. Um, what is the maximum number of distance travelled? I've seen the report on there. Was it 6.2 miles? Was it 10.2 miles? So I think Dawn's done a really great um, equality assessment. Uh, if you turn to Appendix 2, it will give you all of that detail um, in terms of, of the distance travel compared to um, current distance travel. Dawn, I don't know whether you want to, to come in on that. Yes, um, what we did in the impact assessment was we looked at the distance that every uh, the existing service user would have to travel if they travelled um, to Cromwell Road rather than their existing uh, service at this existing centre. And I think the average came out at around an extra, uh, just under 10 minutes extra journey. So uh, for some people, it actually worked out slightly less. Okay, uh, thank you, Dawn. I just want, I'm obviously aware that people are tuning in to watch this as well. We want to make this clear. They, they can't see this agenda in front of us and they, they can't see that stuff. But the, we're not closing down this report is not closing down any service this is literally relocating it to a better venue that already exists is that correct yeah that is correct yeah brilliant okay thank you and, and that's extending its hours as well yeah yeah the extra respite and the, uh, the evening services um okay i i like the idea of the well-being um side of it the the individual care packages I see we're now going to be increasing to 10 people if this goes through. Is that quite correct? Is it 10 staff? It's, it, we'll, we'll be, um, it's not about increasing staff, it's about transforming the way that staff work. Yeah. Self-directed team. And the teams will be, yeah, about 10 staff. About team. 10 staff. Yeah, yeah. But, but there'll be more than one team. There's Because the teams care for fewer people and get to know the same people. Yeah. I was quite disappointed to read that um, this industry is seen as a low paid and sort of like low value with retention of staff. Um, I don't know if there's anything we can do to highlight how much we need these people and to stay in, stay in on it. Um, the value that they give our community is obviously immense. Um, I'm going to stop there and just move on to some floor questions. I will be coming back. Uh, Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was quite upset when I read the report about um, specifically on the Meals on Wheels service that it was a nice to have service rather than an essential one. And I think many of us would agree that it's actually far more than just a delivery of a food, um, a food meal. I think that we know that many staff check on the medication that residents have taken just check on their general well-being, you know, just checking on lots of our elderly people who sadly don't have lots of visitors. So it's much more than a, just a, a delivery service. I'm concerned that there hasn't been a proper consultation. It, there was just a satisfaction survey. And I think that there does need to be a proper a consultation where people are asked this question because it might be different under those circumstances. A couple of questions. In paragraph 3.63, it says users pay four pounds per meal and we pay much higher so my first question is what's much higher um, on 5.1 it said 66% uh, had alternative options this was from the satisfaction survey so what about the other 34% of our residents and I really do feel like these are our older people and we really need to make sure that they're okay like even if one person is worse off that as, as councillor Hewlin mentioned her uh, father if, if that could be one of our relatives we, we'd be really worried about that and the reason I say that is because it doesn't appear that there is a service yet in place to replace it I understand the need to be efficient but what are we replacing this with at the moment it seems like we're just saying we're going to close this service and then we'll see what something to, to pop up hopefully something within the community but that's not agreed yet and then my one last question is 
it mentions the total savings of 554,000. And, and my question is, will this be reinvested in the service to make sure that overall adult social care it still has that investment to make the best services for the people that, that need it. Thank you, Chair. Gosh, okay, I'll have a go, I'll try and have a go at some of those and uh, maybe Dawn can chip in uh, as well. In terms of the additional cost that's also set up in 3.63, so after all of the four pounds of meals, uh, so all the four pound incomes are um, tallied up, um, the difference between that and the cost to run it to, to us is a further £190,000. I don't have off the top of my head, um, nor can I actually calculate off the top of my head, the, the additional cost per meal, because I, I don't know how many meals um, that there are. That's not in the report, but we can get you that figure and work with those sums out if, if you're interested. Um, in terms of um, the um, uh, timing, um, in terms of of what's coming into place. I think it's a fair challenge. Um, no decision has been made on this and there is a little bit of chicken and egg. We can't start developing new services before a decision has been made to close this one. We have um, been in con conversation already, um, as I say, the service manager and there are a, a wide range of alternative um, providers as well that, that, that provide uh, similar services. Um, there will be no, if Cabinet were to make the decision um, upon Mills on Wheels, then that wouldn't come into effect until next financial year. So there'd still be a significant period of time to try and um, uh, develop that micro enterprise uh, and assess all of those clients and look for other alternatives. But you kind of can't do one before the decision's been made. In terms of the reinvestment, um, unfortunately, that is beyond um, uh, my pay grade or sphere of control. So, as you know, um, we don't ring fence um, council budgets other than the ones um, specified by government. Um, and so, um, any say that the budget for adult social care next year will be set um, in a normal budget um, setting way um, that yeah, will, will be proposed and go to cabinet for approval. So I can't give you a guarantee that the £556,000 will come back to adult social care because that's not how council finances um, operate, I'm afraid. Um, Dawn, I don't know whether there's anything else you wanted to add in terms of, of detail. Yeah, it, uh, just really to assure members that um, it, we, we will be, con you know, should this be agreed, we will be ahead and contacting every single service user and, and reassessing their needs, making sure that there is something in place. It, it's not a case of just walking away and leaving them. We will absolutely make sure that we support them. Uh, Councillor, I'm just going to go to uh, Councillor Hodgson because she has more information to answer one of your questions. You're shaking your head. If you'd rather I didn't tell you the information to answer your question, I'm happy not to say. With all due respect, Councillor Hoolan, you have ample opportunity on a number of forums. I am really to question officers. I, I, I appreciate your time Council, being here this evening, Council but Holloway, I don't think it adds value. I'm, I'm looking for, Holloway, sorry, I'm we, looking for a, per, not a political answer, from a, 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 just I, an officer answer, so that's what I uh, capture. I, I, I wasn't Holloway. going to give you a political answer, Councillor. I'd actually worked out the figure that you were asking the, the officer for that he couldn't respond to. I was politely going to offer that information, but if you don't wish it to be shared, that's absolutely fine. It's not a problem. Uh, Councillor Hoodland, I'd love to hear the figure. Thank you. Um, of the 90 people that are taking up on the service, 29 have been identified to so far that definitely do need this service to continue. Now, I've asked officers the same as um, Councillor Holloway as to make sure that everybody is contacted. But what I did was I took the 190,000, divided it by the 29 people, and it comes out to just under £18 a meal cost to so us. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, so that's eight, £18 per meal. Um, I'm aware, Ian, so just going back to you quickly, um, that in the other proposal there was... Uh, set out that there's this um, other little company that wants to be set up as an enterprise. 
Do we know how much they would be charging per mill? Um, <clears throat> so the, the micro enterprise be, uh, is not set up yet. That, that's a program. We, we've set up hundreds of these. We work to support individuals who want to provide all sorts of different services. They've, they've largely been centred around different elements of adult social care. Um, but given that it's not set up yet, I, I couldn't tell you that figure. That would need to be uh, worked out. But what we do find is, is often where you um, um, provide services through micro enterprises, they can do it um, far more cheaply and far more effectively than, than larger bureaucracies where, where the scale is relatively small and, and provide a, 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 a more personal touch. I, I think the other thing to say about micro enterprises is what we find is that the, the people actually running the service really benefit as well. So you get a kind of double benefit in terms of the community. Uh, thank you, Ian. Councillor Holloway. Thank you. If I had the opportunity to come in, I would have said I completely understand that those that, that calculation, it, it does not present a value for, for the service that we're providing. So I really do recognise that and do think that we should be running the, the service in a better way. My concern is the reduction of the service not supporting the, the user and that there are no plans in place. The micro enterprise isn't yet set up. There is nothing in place yet, and there, whilst it won't happen yet because of the chicken and egg, I'm really concerned that there's no safety net to ensure that there is going to be a service for the people that are impacted. I really would like to put forward a recommendation in that case, and I'm sure there is a way around looking at these, some of these options before the next financial year. If the Cabinet do decide to take this forward, that we should recommend to Cabinet that the service shouldn't be cut until there's a consultation that's been taken place, and a replacement service is in place for those who need it. And individual plans are currently, for those who are currently receiving Meals on Wheels, are established. And when all that's done, we will have a better service. But we can be assured that no one is going to be forgotten or missed. Thank you, Councillor. As you know, that's why, what we're here for, to analyse this, to put it apart, put it back together, to make sure we understand it, to cross your eyes, dot the T's before it moves forward. Um, yeah, I am deeply concerned that there is 28 people that, in theory, could be left without a Mills on Wheels, which doesn't really exist. We know Mills on Wheels disappeared years ago. But also, I am aware that we have an obligation to provide nutrition, um, and that's a legal obligation. So I understand that they will, we will find a way to do that. We need to have a look at the, the, the bones of this, then to work out how to do it. It's like you don't build a house and you know, stick the roof on first. We've got to work out, you're correct, we've got to work out what is going to be left there. Um, Councillor Fish first. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> In the report, it refers several times to independence. And I think what we mean by independence is people having choice and control over what happens to them and the support that they need to actually um, be able to have a, you know, a, be the same as everybody else. Now, uh, Council Holloway talked about consultation a couple of times. I'd like to see this service developed alongside service users. Service users have been fully involved in the development of the service, not just consulted. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I was say, Ian, do you want to come back in on that? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right, Councillor Fish, but uh, actually the Care Act of 2014 places a, a legal duty on the local authority um, to actually ensure that every service user has the correct package of care and levels of services and support to maximise their independence. So, so that's an absolute given, and we will, um, under our Care Act obligations, um, actually continue to assess every one of these service users to make sure um, that we're meeting our obligations. In terms of designing new services, that's something slightly different. Um, you won't find anyone more enthusiastic than me for co-design and co-production um, approaches, so the point you make is absolutely correct uh, and the right one. And um, I'm sure um, Dawn and Sue Wellard, in terms of the um, conversations that they're having in terms of micro enterprise would absolutely want um, full involvement of service users in, in anything that, that was developed. But, but we need to be careful we don't confuse services with our, our actual our obligation 
to treat everyone individually and to assess everyone's needs uh, and to ensure um, that we have bespoke packages of care that, that maximise their independence because that's absolutely the right thing to do. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Councillor Polly. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> with our most vulnerable adults, I, I think we've all had relatives or I, I've known it in a, a professional capacity where we visit, visit um, homes where meals have been delivered at 12 o'clock because that's where they are on the rotor. They're left on a side table or they or the person's even put them in the fridge to then form them up later without without realising um, that, that that may be all right perhaps for a younger person, but as, as we get older, our immune systems change. We, we can react to, um, or they'll eat the pudding before the dinner. We also have a very um, diverse demographic in uh, Thurrock, and I certainly am aware that um, speaking with residents and, and that, that um, appetite is always very poor with the elderly. Um, you have to give them something that interests them, that they, they want to eat, and sometimes a lasagna for one person isn't as attractive as a, a, a chicken curry for somebody else or a, a roast dinner for somewhere else. I've got two examples in Perfleet. Uh, Alison Campbell, she does one of these micro... Uh, services where she actually goes to individuals, discusses their menu with them, their home cooked dinners as, as, an, as her audience, her customers would identify them. Uh, so they can ask for uh, I, I don't know, a bacon and suet rolls or, or something that they, they've got a fond memory of, something they're going to enjoy eating. And one of the problems that I've always been aware of with the, the Meals on Wheels, we, Wheels service is it, it's delivered in such a short time window. It, and, and obviously all the people that are involved with it are very caring people that want to support the elderly. But trying to get round the borough for a start at that time of day is challenging trying to get meals to individual homes that are still warm and hot is is also challenging. You haven't got the time to sit there and encourage that person to actually... There's nothing nicer than sharing a meal with somebody. I think we're all agreed with that. If you're on your own, you, you snack a sandwich and, and you've not really enjoyed it. If you've got someone that can sit and have a cup of tea with you while you're eating your dinner, uh, it makes it much more enjoyable um, experience. And I think some of these micro-enterprises may be able to offer that because they're dealing on a smaller scale, more local, more parochial to their local area. I think nutritionally, we have to be more mindful. We, we're more aware of things like colitis, diverticulitis, things that can irritate people's um, digestive systems. Uh, you know, we, we as has been suggested, we can deliver a much more person-focused, person-centred approach, which I think is key. In, in um, we, we focus a lot on schools and putting the right nutrition into our younger people. We should put every much focus and energies into ensuring that our elderly residents are, are being offered... Um, you know, something they want to eat and something that is equally nutritious. Mm. And I do feel very strongly that this is quite done well, and I absolutely agree with Councillor Holloway. It's not, it's not, there has to be a safety net. There has to be something in place until we, we can explore this. We also are minded that a lot of the people in that 29 may have capacity issues. So consulting with somebody, sending a form through a doorpost to, to somebody who, who perhaps can't, you know, where is the guardianship? Where, where are the support agencies? We, we've got some fantastic services that run out of the Beehive. Let's engage with them. You've got Dial, you've got the advocacy service, you've got Bias. You, you, 
I, I think there is room there to, if we, it's the quality of the consultation. I think we're always aware of that, isn't it? Who, who, who are we speaking to? Um, as, as regards um, the daycare uh, situation, uh, I, I, I personally think people are quite parochial about their areas. I, I think when we try and open it up to, to everyone sharing Cromwell, I, I don't know how that will work uh, because you, you'll probably get little herds within the complex sort of taking over their type, their areas, one will want to do one activity or whatever. So that, that needs management, that needs investigating, uh, exploring, but I, I, do, I do welcome this report actually, and I do see a lot, a lot of positives in there. And I, as a starting point, because that's what this document is, it's to open up that conversation and, and not just become complacent. Believe me, the referral process to get somebody support in their home, own home it is difficult for somebody who has knowledge of the system. If, if you're, as we've experienced in this last 18 months, first time user of the service, becoming new to it, um, it, it's a minefield, and people are already feeling isolated, whereas this this offers the potential to make it a more uh, people-friendly service, and I think that that can only be welcome. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Um, come back to Ian. On listening to what the councillors have said, would this nutrition and, and meal basing be something that will be integrated into their care packages? Um, when we're changing and analysing and being bespoke care packages for the residents, would the food be incorporated into that? Could we see a carer going into cook a meal? Uh, that would very much depend on the needs of the individual, is, is the short answer. The idea is that you provide bespoke care to promote independence um, rather than have policies about um, one size fits all. And kind of uh, what Councillor Polly, I think, has just really quite powerfully demonstrated the power of, of micro enterprises. And when you work at a much more local level, in a much more bespoke way, you can often get a, a, a much better service um, that, that really meets the needs of that individual. And um, that's actually cheaper as well. And um, so you get a win win. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, I mean, I guess what I was looking at is trying to find an answer for those 28 people that have no other option and how they but could do it. My point is we shouldn't try and find an answer here because we won't know the answer. The answer may be different for each one of those 28. And the answer, may, I don't think, is a one-size-fits-all service. We need 28 answers, which is why we need 28 assessments. And that's why we yeah. need consultation with them, probably, then. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Piccolo. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions and points um, of clarification more than anything else. Um, <clears throat> it says all current, all, future, all current and future surface users will be provided with transport to Cromwell Road when needed. I take that that because we can cope with the increase because obviously people living further away um, and normally going to Carnot Court might not be using, shall we say, uh, transport, they may be being dropped off by a relative or a family member or whatever. Um, but if service is going to be provided um, when needed at Cromwell Road, as, as long as we've got the capacity to do that. Um, also, if um, going back on what we've just covered on the last point, I noticed in the report it says if someone, in the report it says if someone can't source a meal, a meal will be provided for, um, will be supported by uh, Cromwell House. Um, so that, I say that's in the port. I don't know whether that can be clarified as well. So if someone isn't able to provide a meal um, of those 26 or 29 people, for whatever reason, um, Cromwell House will support them until such time perhaps something else comes into place. Um, and just the other thing on, on, the, on the smaller teams. Um, I mean, my mother's um, 
96 years old and she's had carers for five years. Um, she's over in Redbridge and that's a, they've got a very good system over there. I think in the, uh, she has two different carers coming during the course of the day uh, and I think she's had the same two carers probably for the last four years. Um, and that with smaller teams now operating, that has a massive benefit because if you're swapping and changing between carers, they can't, quite often can't pick up on the little changes that occur uh, and realise that someone's feeling a bit down, someone's feeling a bit depressed, where you've got more regular contact with the same, same, same people all the time. I mean, my mother now treats her carers as friends, um, and sometimes they pop in and see her when they're passing. Um, so anything that brings that sort of um, support to our elderly and vulnerable residents can only be a good thing in my view, and that's from personal experience. But as I say, if you could just qualify that there's, there won't, the transport will be supply, uh, provided at Cromer Road, no matter what centre they were going, and just confirm as well that up until such other replacements are put in place, anybody that can't get a cooked meal will be supported by Cromwell House until such time that support can be put in place. Thank you. Um, uh, I entirely agree with what you, you, your last point about the importance of what we call continuity of care. And, and you kind of nailed it there, councillor. When you've got different people coming in, then you miss the opportunities to actually notice when someone is deteriorating or improving. Um, and so, uh, yeah, early action and prevention um, is much harder to deliver. And I, I think on a just like a human level, I know personally, I can't think of anything more dehumanising than having a different person come into your home every day to provide personal care. I remember quite vividly speaking to an elderly gentleman when I, I visited the wellbeing teams not long after they've been set up and I, I, I spoke to um, uh, this gentleman about how he was finding the service. Um, what he said to me was, I used to think it was my fault. When I had the old system, then I'd get a carer for three days and then they'd leave and I'd get another carer. And I think, what have I done to actually offend this person? And he said, I used to live my life in a state of constant anxiety because I never knew from one day to the next who was coming through my front door. And he said, since the wellbeing teams have been in place, my life has changed immeasurably. And I, I wake up with a feeling of joy, was his phrase, um, as a result of, of the difference that this has made to his life. In terms of your two specific questions, Dawn, can, can you just pick those up in terms of the transport and in terms of uh, Cromwell Road and the meals? Yes, so the, the, the transport will still be available. So people coming from Kynet Court and um, from South Ockingen will, will actually have um, still retain all the minibuses and the drivers that we have now. So it's just a question of them taking some the, 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 uh, people to somewhere different. But what we want to do is to offer a much more choice around um, you know how how people come to the centre. So as it's as it was working before the pandemic, people would come for the whole day. So they'd be picked up in the morning. They come for the whole day. They go home in the evening. Now that might suit some people, but it might not suit everybody. So the plan will be to make again make that much more bespoke, so that people can pick and choose. Maybe come for a morning and and. And, and also to maybe shorten the journeys by not be taking everybody in one go, but to have a sort of constant flow of transport in and out of the centre. Um, and with regards to the, um, the, the the meals out of Cromwell Road, um, I, I think that really is our safety net, that you know, if there is somebody that actually we cannot find a bespoke um, a solution for, then we will be having meals at the day centre. So um, that would be our safety net that we would be able to, to take a meal out from there in, in some way. We wouldn't leave somebody um, with absolutely nothing. Uh, Councillor Piquet, do you want to come back in on that? Yeah, just... Um, uh, uh, we're saying that we can, the transport can be supplied to everybody that's using the other two daycare centres at the present. Obviously, there may be some people that um, aren't using our transport at present to get to those centres because they live close enough to the centre that either the neighbour will drop them off or, you know, they can make 
their, their way there on their own, uh, under their own steam. Um, will, we, will we be able to cope with that influx, if there is one, of those people that, whilst they could make their own way to their existing centre, will need to possibly have transport to the new centre? Uh, yes, we will. In, in fact, we, we do plan within the restructure to just slightly increase the number of drivers. So, um, yeah, there, there should be capacity. I mean, obviously, it will depend on, on the numbers. But as it stands at the moment, 85% of people attending do come via you know, via the minibuses. So I, I, I can't foresee that being a problem. Thank you. I just want to jump on one of the Councillor Piccolo's uh, questions. You say that out of these 29 or 28 people that may not be able to get meal could get it from Cromwell Road. What happens if they're not capable of using the minibus, that their conditions are, are we going to be transporting meals to them? Um, you know, there may be a situation where these people don't leave their houses. I think, again, it comes down to folk offer. We can't give a one size fits all but there, there may be people for whom that needs to be the safety net, and then maybe a meal does need to be taken out to them. But that would be, uh, obviously, our last resort, but it is that safety net, just in case. So no one will ever go without a meal? Well, as I say, we will reassess everybody to make sure they've got something. But that safety net will be there just in case there, there are no other options. Thank you. Uh, Neil, would you like to come in? Thank you, uh, thank you Chair. Um, a, co a few points. Um, in terms of the, the Meals on Wheels situation, just to say it might help councillors, as a provider, I can assure you that in the community, it's about the solutions for each individual. So we have some people that get food, particularly since COVID, from a local pub. It might be from a cafe, it might be from a family member. And recently, um, a massive company called Gusto's moved into Averley. And there at the moment, it might not be public knowledge, but they're, they're distributing free meals to vulnerable people as a, as a way of testing their systems. And uh, the report so far is they're very good quality. So, you know, th there will be solutions out there that the, the wellbeing teams, I'm sure these teams that are working with individuals will work on. So from, from our point of view, we were less worried about the, meal, the meals on wheels are, are going because we think people will find a solution, be supported by the way that people are working. We really welcome the, 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 the wellbeing idea of, you know, working with people as individuals and one-to-one, -one, et cetera. Um, when we to think about the... Uh, closure as it, as it could read of, of a day centre that is always very scary and I am someone that has been involved in that in the past so I know what that feels like but for us when we read this we were talking about it and saying it's not so much a closure more a consolidation and we felt that that probably would make sense however we did have a joke that no one's going to get a lift from Dawn Shepherd if she thinks the average speed is 30 miles an hour in, in Thurrock because <laughs> she's probably doing 50 so, so that, but all jokes aside the transport needs very careful solutions because, because it will be longer for some people. So having minibuses as she has that are good quality and with air conditioning, I think is critical for our vulnerable citizens. Having said all of that, there was a big debate with us about is this a consultation and what does that look like? As, as members have said, you know, a survey is one thing, but consultation is a bit different. And it, felt, it was felt that people would like to hear the voice of the older people more, as, as Councillor Fish mentioned, but also of carers, of family carers, because our experience of day opportunities, uh, day services as such, is that for some people that is the respite. I was really pleased to hear um, uh, someone one of the officers talking about um the fact that people could um it is seen as respite and people understand that it's a break for their families but it's about getting that right for them as individuals and and the offer really was if people wanted uh the the local user-led organization the thorough coalition to do some surveys with carers maybe uh, or some surveys with the older people themselves we would be happy to do that as, as independents um and the other point was just how future proof is this because we remembered reading about something you were building on the old Whiteacre site I don't know if that's still happening was that not going to be a day opportunity because I'm worried about future capacity in terms of the population of Thurrock somewhat getting older and there being more vulnerable people around that might need this sort of service so how confident are the officers that there's a kind of future proof to this that was the other comment that was made thank you I think that's a great question to ask Ian <laughs> How future-proof is it, Ian? Um, pre predicting the future is a fool's errand, errand I've, uh, I've uh, 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 maintained throughout COVID and tried very much not to do it. I mean, COVID in some senses is a good, good example about something comes along and then everything changes. 
doesn't it? And um, you know, the way we've shifted to digital during COVID, uh, we're never going to go back to where we were previously. Have we been seeing the world through a, a, um, a pre-COVID lens in terms of a need for capacity for health services? We've probably come up with a very different model to, to now. Um, having said all of that, I think it's a good challenge. Um, we have a burgeoning older population. Um, uh, I think we need, and you kind of mentioned it there, Neil, we need a plurality of provision and bespoke provision. I think actually that's how you best future-proof things rather than settle on a single model and then try and expand it and expand it. Because one size doesn't fit all. Not everyone does want to go to um, a day centre. Uh, and I think um, as uh, the, the new generations come through and become older, then the focus on personal choice and um, offering that plurality of vision actually becomes more and more important because I think younger generations are probably less likely to put up with um, one size fits all of them. You see a greater level of choice and, and freedom in their lives in general. So um, we need to watch the demographics. Um, I think this model is future proof, uh, certainly for the next few years, but. I wouldn't like to give any guarantees um, uh, past that, but then I wouldn't like to give any guarantees about what the service and services um, might need to look like, other than I think they need to be more bespoke and uh, a greater plurality. Thank you, Ian. Um, I just got the image of something that Councillor Polly said, of uh, almost like postcode board with pensioners going down to Common Road and like having their little gangs set up over there. Um, I guess, is Common Road got an area for expansion? I don't really know the location that well myself for that. Shall I, shall I answer that one, Ian? Yeah, yes. sure. <laughs> so at, at the moment, Cromwell Road um, has a number of different rooms, um, uh, which a, a lot of the time are used for office staff and storage. The plan will be to um, change those rooms so that, for example, we'll have a room for... Um, craft and art and um, a, a cooking area, various activities that can go on. So again, we can offer that menu of activities so people don't just come and sit in one room and do something all together. People will have a choice to do what they want throughout the day. And, 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 and an out, sorry, in an outside area as well, there's quite um, there's, there's a garden around the centre with a, a potting shed. So again, an opportunity to do outside activities as well. It just seems very strange to try and get my head around people mixing again, you know, who <laughs> we've spent the last so long trying to get them to separate. Uh, brilliant, thank you. I'm just going to bring Councillor Holloway. Oh, I think Councillor Sammons had her hand up before me, Chair. I'll say, Councillor Sammons. Thank you. Yeah, having myself been involved in transporting people backwards and forwards to clubs and venues over the years, I've always found that the journey was part of their day. They thoroughly enjoyed the journey. So I can't imagine that many of them are going to be complaining that maybe they're 10 minutes longer on a minibus. Some of them get quite comfortable and don't actually want to get to the destination. But I, I have been involved in clubs for quite a few years and it's very nice for them to sort of mix with people. They get their own little friendship groups. And so if you're offering a more varied entertainment, if you like, at the day centre, that's got to be a good thing than everybody just sitting there, what we're going to do today. Because this way, they have got a selection. Some people might like to do crafts, Others may find it totally boring. They might want to cook. Um, I've got friends that have got the starting of dementia. And from personal experience, I've found that if somebody does turn up with the meals on wheels, as the councillor said, it's left on the side. They may forget they've got a meal that they should be putting in the microwave and eating. So I think if we're going to get a service where maybe somebody's going to come in and encourage them to eat and even help, that's got to be better than somebody turning up with a meal 
that they may look at and think, well, that's actually not what I fancy today. The, the whole aspect of having a meal, I must agree with what Councillor Poli said, having gone through this with my own mother, they don't eat. If a meal turns up and they're left, you can go there in the evening and the meal's still sat there, which is it's not only wasteful, that's irrespective, but it's then the fact, well, what have they eaten? Have they just picked at the cupboard and gone for biscuits, snacks? Have they even eaten anything? So I think if we're going to try and achieve a, a system where people would come in and be more supportive around mealtime, that's got to be encouraged and hopefully that is the way forward now. What I've found that we have a different generation of old people. Old people years ago, they was quite happy to just sit in a room and chat. This generation of older people need more stimulation. They, they definitely do. I think when it happened, the warden controlled um, communities sort of lost the warden because they were shared out amongst many different venues. The whole community of that system just went to pieces, really because there was nobody there to say, oh, it's bingo today, coffee morning, oh, let's get a coach trip. That changed. Things do change, unfortunately. We have to move and try and progress with the times. So I think a lot of what is in this report does sound very positive and promising. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, before I bring in uh, Vice Chair Councillor Holloway, I think um, just about moving on to some recommendations, I know we've looked at, you know, you've mentioned some, I definitely think there's some sort of formal consultation we'd like to recommend just going forward. Um, do you want to come back in, Councillor? Yes, thank you, Chair. And, and bearing in mind all the really, like, really helpful and excellent comments from the, the committee, I was going to suggest a slight um, change to the recommendation. Mm -hmm. I'm also mindful that a lot of the reports that we get at Health Committee are often for noting and commenting and that I, I, as an ambition of mine this year to try and recommend more and put some more recommendations in for Cabinet, even though I really appreciate that Councillor Hewlin has come to listen to us speak tonight. But I would, uh, on, on that note, maybe change the recommendation to something along the lines of that the service should not be cut until a consultation has been held and individual plans for those currently receiving the Meals on Wheels service are designed in collaboration with service users, their families and carers. Um, I don't think there was a plan to, to actually cut it without anything. Though. It wasn't gone for another year. I think the consultation needs to be done pretty quick. I do um, understand. I, it's just more, for more formalising, as I said, to make sure that as a committee, our voice is formally heard in recommendations that go to reports yeah, I don't want this cut before the consultation has, has been done or anything like that. Um, I don't know if the word cutting is even really it. It's just all changing. Happy um, for the, the, the word to be amended, adapted. Yeah, uh, I'll um, leave that to Jenny's democratic service. Yes, yeah, uh, so I know that the eloquence that this goes as this goes forward. That some form. Uh, what do you want? What sort of consultation? What sort of consultation would like to have? A literally individual one? We'd like to see groups going there doing presentations with them, or how would we best serve this? Knowing that we're still in these restriction times at the moment, and we'd like to. I guess uh, we'd like to get this done pretty soon. Uh, so. Uh, Councillor Polly, first. Sorry, Chair, uh, I wasn't going to offer advice uh, on the consultation <laughs> process so much as perhaps help with the wording that, um, yeah. you know, that this has to be a seamless transition. Yeah. So that it's clear that we're not, we're not, cut, uh, but I agree with Councillor Holloway, I, I think DEM services are much, yeah, much better, better service <laughs> to find the, the wording. Um, and, and I'm just going to be cheeky and say, that I'm on my, it is my first time at committee, and I'm sure you've done this before. My my own mother received palliative care from Thurrock Council's team of carers. Both their reablement service and our carers are carers. It's a service to be proud of. Mm. They are trained to a level 
that he, he's, he's, he's verging on uh, uh, healthcare professionals in that respect. And, but they've got that human factor. Uh, I've, I've never encountered mm. uh, anyone that, that, that's not been happy with their carer. So uh, I, I think um, it may be worth asking the, our own carers um, because they're, they're working with the elderly every day. They're, they're, they're going out to some of the service users that are receiving the Meals on Wheels just, 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 just to consult with, with, with our own carers as well <coughs> yeah. to see what they feel. I mean, it was sad to hear or to read in the report how sort of um, the, the retention, we don't have the great retention in the carers um, and how people are perceived they are so I'd like that to change. I'd like them to feel that they're valued more. Um, with this decision, I'm not sure that, um, that the whole length of that is it going to hold up the process? Is it more value that the pair of the, the the residents and the, their families have more of a say in, in that than what the care was? Uh, Councillor Pickler, yeah, that's just my view. Sorry, just uh, talking yeah. about the. the <coughs> The retention rate of the carers and uh, my reason and again I think whilst I explained earlier on that um, my mother gets a lot of support by ha of having the same carers for four or five years um, in actual fact the carers benefit in the same way as well um, just recently um, the contract was going to pass to another organization um, and the carers asked my mother if they would go she would go with a new organisation because they didn't want to lose contact with her. Yeah. Fortunately, I, I managed to source it so that they, the carers could stay with who they are and the mother could still... But it's, it's, it has important in some cases, and that will hopefully, if we adopt the smaller team working, we will probably retain more carers because they then get to build that relationship with their regular clients, and that gives them another reason for coming to work other than just for what the money is because they build that relationship, they build friendships and it improves their job quality as well. Thank you, Councillor. I think that's very well put. I, you know, it is that friendship as well that they form out of that, um, which, you know, all that goes to reducing longer hospital stays and, you know, more positive people are, their health tends to, to maintain a good level. Um, so let's going on to the recommendations. Um, on section one, have we got any recommendations for the first point, which was the, the I mean, for me, I thought it was quite positive, to be truthful, the, uh, the changes in the wellbeing. I think that was uh, how the groups are going to change in integrated services. Sorry, Chair. I, I would just say that we are overview and scrutiny. Yeah. So... It's quite right to challenge decisions, but it's also our job to acknowledge when things have been done well. Yeah, and I, exactly. I think that we we have a, we sometimes forget that in overview, that uh, and and I think this is perhaps one of those occasions where we can commend yeah. the work that's been done. I mean, it's quite you know we didn't really speak much about the, the well-being teams because I guess it's because we was quite happy with what's going on and the changes that are proposed. Um, it's, it has had you know, the positive side of it. Um, so when we're moving on to the relocations of the day services, any recommendations you would like to make on that? Just to support what Councillor Piccolo has, has, has said, uh, Again, the, the, the transportation, um, just the, the recommendation that the transportation is, and I agree with uh, Neil as well, it has to be the right transportation because if, if we are looking at elderly and infirmed people, uh, a minibus sometimes doesn't have the best suspension. <laughs> if, if, you, if you've got osteoporosis, uh, arthritic joints, it can be very uh, painful, it, it, yeah. it's a very uncomfortable journey. So I, I think uh, the recommendation would would to be look at uh, suitable transportation. Yeah, um, 
I don't know who'd be the best one to answer that, just quickly. Ian, uh, uh, do we, what sort of minibuses we have? Are they the new ones or the ones that we'd be bringing in from outside companies or? Don't you want to, this is getting into the granularity. <laughs> they, are, <laughs> they are our own minibuses and, and obviously they're adapted to be able to take um, wheelchairs and, um, you know, to sit them inside the minibus safely and securely. Um, I'm sure there probably are, you know, brand new, wonderful, fantastic minibuses out there that may be better. Um, but we, we don't, we, we don't have any complaints about the minibuses at the moment, so um, I don't see it too much of an issue. But for me, it's a real safety, uh, you know, transporting people in wheelchairs and, and, and just making sure that they're comfortable and safe. Brilliant, thank you. Perhaps we need to get onto the highway to make sure there's no puddles on the way. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Uh, Councillor Sammons. Yeah, just to reassure you, because for 20 years I've done that sort of transport for people, special needs, schools, transport, people shopping, etc. It's most people that drive minibuses for reputable companies would have had Midas training, which I do think is something the council themselves have encouraged but should check that this is being carried out with the companies because Midas training not only teaches the driver and the, usually if there's somebody else, a carer of some sort, that that person is specifically trained in transporting wheelchairs in particular because as you say, it can be quite challenging to make sure you're not flying over road humps at 40 mile an hour, bouncing people. Wheelchairs are specialised transport. They need to be secured properly. You can't just put in a wheelchair and put the seatbelt around. There's special clamps that go with them. And people have to be seatbelted properly. You can't have people travelling randomly backwards. There's specific rules about transport. It's not so much about whether the vehicle is a new vehicle or an old vehicle. It's more about the training of the staff that drive those vehicles. Most, most companies that transport those sort of <laughs> special, specialised transport are very aware of the people that they're transporting. We've been pushed on, so we're going to have to move on to our recommendations I'm now. sure it will be dealt with. Okay, brilliant, thank, thank you. you. Um, just to say, so, okay, on that one, the recommendation is just to ensure that um, suitable transport is used. And on for the uh, changing the food supply, the uh, Mills on Wheels service, our recommendations are... Uh, I'm hoping that Jenny wrote down what I said and added in about the seamless transition yep, you got that the council yep, of Polly's doing. <laughs> Thank you. Do we need to vote on that, Jenny, or is it as, uh, if the committee are in agreement? I, th I think we are. Uh, hands up for everyone who's in agreement for the recommendation. Yep, brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Can I can I make um, just just make sure that there's something else included, which I think is really important. Yes. It's not just the consultation; it's a collaborative approach. Yeah. Collaborative approach. Yeah. Great word. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, okay, item A, Austin Hospital and Integrated Medical Centres update. This report can be set out separately on the mem... Uh, what was it? We got this on our desk tonight, didn't we? Uh, so it's on our table. Uh, can I ask Ian Wake and Chris Smith to present this item, please? Who's disappeared? What one of them? Ian's popped back. Sorry, I thought Christopher was taking this, actually. Is Christopher in there? Yes, yeah, Christopher. <laughs> oh, just on the on the right. Right. Thank Stop. you very much. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, let me uh, uh, just run through the uh, report uh, number item number eight uh, on um, also the hospital closure and the integrated medical centres. First, uh, just by way of background, 
the Integrated Medi Medical Center program uh, arose out of concerns about the uh, quality of health care uh, in various parts of the, uh, the borough. Uh, and uh, a commitment on the part of the council and NHS partners to address that. Address it by moving from outdated facilities and, and rather fragmented services, separate health, uh, community and social care services, and moving to a much more integrated offer um, uh, wrapped around the needs of individual uh, service users and residents. The uh, ambition for the uh, integrated medical centres is set out in a memorandum of understanding. Uh, between the Council, uh, Basildon Hospital, North East London Foundation Trust and uh, Essex University, uh, 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 University Trust, Essex Partnership University Trust, um, and the Clinical Commissioning Group. And the, uh, the ambition is to create uh, four new, medical new integrated medical centres on sites in Tilbury uh, to serve uh, Tilbury and Chadwell, in Corringham uh, to serve Stamford La Hope and, and Corringham, uh, it, in Perfleet to serve Perfleet on Thames, uh, Averley and South Orkington, and Greys uh, primarily to serve Greys, but also to have uh, to act as a central hub with a wider range of services, particularly uh, acute services which may move out of Basildon Hospital uh, or indeed um, Orsett Hospital uh, when it closes. But the, I must say the, uh, the uh, Integrated Medical Centre program is much more than about uh, four uh, new buildings. It's also about a new model of care, about bringing together a, a new primary care offer or enhanced GP services, uh, bringing together uh, community health care services and mental health care services, uh, also, also bringing uh, joint working with the uh, well-being teams we've heard about earlier, uh, technology-enabled care, and a range of community and voluntary services which can cooperate on a co-located site. So we've been working with uh, our um, health partners uh, to uh, develop this, uh, um, this concept, this new model of care, so that we can have much more flexible working, working across disciplines, uh, such that the um, the use of the integrated medical centres themselves, apart from the GP services, will be a much more flexible and a multidisciplinary approach with individual services not occupying um, particular rooms, but uh, using the resource in the most flexible way uh, throughout the day and indeed uh, through the week. We are looking at uh, the prospect of seven day a week working in these centres. To ensure the medical centres are focused on the particular needs of the uh, populations across uh, Thurrock and noting that there are differences in the uh, health and well-being across Thurrock, uh, we've been working with public health to identify the particular uh, service, act service activities required in those centres, working with health planners to design programmes to address the uh, particular morbidities in, that are prevalent in areas, and also working to future-proof the centres to take account of demographic change and ageing population uh, and also uh, population growth. So that's giving us a new model of care, a new model of integrated working across a range of specialism. Now I know we have uh, Tanya on the uh, call this evening, so before I move to talk about the development of the individual centres, can I ask if, if Tanya can uh, contribute by giving a, a position update on where we are in Corringham and Stanford La Hope? I think uh, Tanya has um, some technical problems. Can't hear you again, Tanya. Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to log off? Try again? Well, uh, perhaps I can do no. my best and um, we can see if we can get a better connection with Tanya, Tanya later. So the, um, the uh, Integrated Medical Centre in uh, Stanford Hope and Corringham uh, uh, is located in the Sorrels next to the, uh, to the school, being developed by North East London Foundation Trust and is the most, most advanced of the four uh, IMCs. Um, it got uh, secured planning uh, approval in 2018 and actually work started on site earlier in the year. Um, there's going to be a, a, a new uh, GP practice around 2,000 patients list size, uh, a range of adult services, diabetes services, cardiac and respiratory services, uh, and a range of other services which will be uh, 
particularly targeting the needs in Corringham uh, and Stanford. The uh, work on site is uh, progressing well. Um, steel frame and um, metal decking has been completed, and now the first floor concrete slabs are being uh, poured. Uh, metal framing will be going up. If you have a look on site, you'll see that the work is very well advanced. Uh, and with an estimated build uh, time of 15 months, we anticipate the, the IMC in Corringham will be operational from uh, spring of next year. So that's the most advanced uh, IMC. We're also uh, progressing well in plans with the uh, Integrated Medi Medical Centre in Tilbury and Chadwell. And this is a site in, the, in Civic Square in um, Tilbury. Uh, this is now at uh, what we call Reva Stage 2. This is a concept design. Uh, so we have quite detailed uh, uh, plans for the building which, have, uh, which uh, take account of the schedule of accommodation we've uh, worked with our partners to develop. Uh, we actually had a consultation with, um, uh, we've had, had consultations with uh, local people including the school. Um, uh, in, in Tilbury and we are at the stage I think of uh, really pushing the button on Tilbury. There's been a slight pause over the last few months while we've been looking at the uh, new NH NHS requirement for net zero carbon buildings. Uh, we've got a design in Tilbury that's a little too far advanced to incorporate much of that requirement in the building structure itself, but from an operational point of view, uh, it will be uh, designed to achieve net zero carbon. Uh, and so we're pr pressing on with that uh, design program and uh, a consultation about the uh, facility uh, with the hope that that uh, IMC will be uh, uh, operational, uh, completed and operational in 24 uh, 2024, um, perhaps 2025, but actually we think we can bring that forward now that we have a solution around the uh, net zero carbon. So 2024 is the ambition for uh, the IMC in Tilbury. Uh, work also progressing in Purfleet, uh, in the new town centre in Purfleet, uh, adjacent to the station. Um, it's uh, being re-provided there. The development in Perfleet is uh, being led by the developer, Perfleet Re Centre Regeneration Limited. Uh, they're also well advanced in their design. They held a consultation workshop at High House Production Park this afternoon uh, with a range of stakeholders to review the plans for the facility there. Uh, there the plan is to have uh, two floors of a larger residential building as the Integrated Medical Center looking onto a, uh, a public square, and as I say, uh, just, just next to the station. Uh, there again, we have a, an agreed schedule of accommodation and a very uh, high, high profile team of architects with a good track record in health center development, Orford Hall, Monaghan Mor Morris. Um, and the uh, work on that uh, in, 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 uh, till, uh, pardon, in Perfleet is aimed to complete in mid-2024. So that's a development that is being led by, the, by uh, PCRL and delivered as part of uh, Section 106 agreement. Uh, finally, the Grays IMC on the uh, Long Lane Hospital, uh, the Community Hospital site in Long Lane. Uh, this is uh, not necessarily uh, a new build. Uh, it's uh, probably a, a facility that will use the existing buildings on site, and so uh, we are less certain about the time frame for that. It may come a little bit earlier because there's not any requirement for necessarily any requirement for uh, a new build development. Uh, the site is owned by uh, Exix Partnership University Trust um, and they are working with Basildon Hospital to uh, identify the, uh, a master plan for the site which will include um, uh, certainly an integrated medical centre with a, with a GP practice moving into it and also the necessary facilities to enable outpatient services from Basildon Hospital and Orsett Hospital to, uh, to move on to that site. As I said before, serving a, a wider area. Um, the um, plans for that are, are not well advanced. The, uh, there have been delays because of the pandemic. Uh, we started uh, early last year, but we've had a, a probably about a 12, 15 month period where, where we haven't seen much work taken forward. That work is now progressing again. The relevance groups have been set up, uh, the commitment's been uh, reaffirmed, and we hope to see that, uh, that uh, IMC in place uh, uh, by 2025, which is the target date for the, uh, 
for the uh, completion of, um, for the closure of Orsett Hospital. Orsett Hospital, obviously, having to close before, have to be, um, have to, the integrated medical centres having to be in place before Orsett Hospital uh, can close. Um, and in, in relation to the closure plans, uh, as I say, that's, that's not uh, progressed very much in the last 12, 15 months. Uh, the relevant um, planning groups are now coming back on stream uh, and we expect the work to be undertaken, uh, effectively undertaken from October this year. So that's a, a, an update on uh, the programme. There's a few other technical matters related to uh, the business cases for these uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, developments. We have dedicated resources for, for taking that forward. Um, and so we, we feel we're making good progress uh, in quite challenging times. Thank you, Chloe Paul. Um, I think, first of all, what I'd like to say is that um, I understand, obviously, the closure of all the hospitals except for 2025. Um, so having noted that, obviously, that that doesn't shut. If we have a delay, looking at some of these, the target date to 2025 um, without any delays, if for some reason that was pushed to 2026, we do need reassurance from also Hospital that they're not going to shut. You know, the specifications were, if I'm correct, uh, Councillor Holloway, maybe I come on this, that the, the hospital can't shut until the IMC is built. So we do need a re reassurance with that because some of these dates are being really pushed up to that limit now. Uh, coming on to the Coronam IMC, one thing I'd like to pick out on there, he's got the 2,000 extra patient spaces. Is that a completely new surgery that's being set up, or is that existing doctors in the area that are taking over those spaces within that doctor's surgery, the new ones? So it's a surgery as well? Yeah. Uh, Rahul, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, I think, um, so within, within the corridor, we will be moving in the the, the doctor surgeries. Um, so, so the existing doctors from Stanford and Corringham will take up the with the extra space over there. So we, we are in consultation with our GP partners within um, Corringham um, to ascertain the, um, the, the buy-in and the interest on it. So we've got about two practices who are interested to move into that surgery. Uh, into the into the new IMC. So basically, that is a load of rubbish about the 2,000 spaces. That is not extra appointments. We critically need extra spaces for doctor's appointments. The IMC is nip, not fit for purpose in Coronham, and probably not even for Perfleet if that is what is going to happen. We need extra spaces. We need new doctors in there, not existing doctors relocating to it. Sorry to be quite passionate about that. But that doesn't hold up with me. I'm sorry, it doesn't. If I just, if I just come in there, uh, I don't think anyone um, in this, on this call or in the chamber disagrees with you, councillor. The issue is we can't pop down to the GP shop and just buy them. Um, so it's not so much about buildings as it is about workforce. And actually, at the Integrated Care Partnership this afternoon, the hall gave a absolutely fantastic presentation detailing the growing pressure on primary care um, in terms of demand at a time when actually workforce is at best standing still and in reality is reducing because um, uh, we are shifting from GP partners to salaried GPs. Uh, so I, I, it's a little bit chicken and egg again. The concept behind these integrated medical centres was that we can create um, fantastic spaces that are very appealing to new GPs coming through in training. Then, hopefully, in the future, we will be able to um, we will be able to attract more GPs to Thera. But we have to recognise that we're in a competitive market for GPs uh, a, a, against a national shortage and a workforce just remains in and of itself an enormous challenge. I think the other thing I'd say is that um, primary care is much broader than just GPs, and often there are other allied health professionals. And again, um, Rahul's done a brilliant job in terms of the mixed skill workforce and the use of pharmacists and paramedics and 
physio. So I don't think it's just about doctors. Often an adult health professional can treat someone more effectively and, and more quickly than the doctor. Um, I'll, I'll take your, your point, Ian, but then perhaps you know, we need to look at how many houses we're building in Farrakh if we can't get the doctors to serve the patients and the people that live here. It is, no, it is chicken and egg, I understand that, but it's not acceptable that we're not generating new spaces and new doctors in these INCs, because that's what we were promised, really, at the beginning, that, that these were going to be new doctor practices, and clearly they're not. I don't think we ever did promise that. I think what we promised is that exactly what I've said, because we, we, we couldn't, no one can promise okay. that. I'm just going to bring in Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Chair. I, I think, to be honest, the, in the IMCs were a, a fair, actually, we, you know, under the last administration, m new health hubs were being built. They weren't called IMCs then. The IMC part came in when the hospital was going to close. So the, a the original, back, back many, many years ago, was four additional health centres to increase capacity. They then turned into, you know, the brilliant plan for an integrated medical centre because the hospital was closing and we could then exactly design bigger, you know, better for the community, et cetera. But the initial, initial idea was absolutely that, to increase capacity within the primary care field. Obviously, we know that workforce is an issue, but the ambition was still there originally that these, was, these would increase capacity. And as the chair said, I mean, and has been mentioned with regards to Perfleet, and Rahul was at the meeting, and it, made, it was made clear that the existing medical centre in Perfleet will actually be closing when the integrated medical centre is opened and everything will, will move there. Now, that wasn't the understanding that anyone believed that that was going to happen. I'm really mindful of workforce. I do understand if we don't have the capacity to fill these spaces. However, that's not what we understood to be happening. That's not what residents thought was going to happen. And obviously, this is this the, the, the IMC in many of these areas aren't just serving the communities where they're placed, Corringham, Greys, Purfleet, they're serving Ockenden, Averley, they're serving borough-wide. So actually, the, the assurances about increased capac capacity in our health system is actually really, really, really concerning. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, does anyone want to come back on that, Ian? Uh, my, my, my response is the same. No one has ever promised additional capacity um, uh, in and of itself. What we've said right the way from the start is that we have a national workforce challenge. I mean, I remember standing up at the Tilbury public meeting and the public meeting myself giving the presentation that said exactly this. Um, we have a national workforce challenge. We are competing. We're in a competitive market for GPs. You can't force GPs to come and work in Thurrock. You have to attract them. And the, the plan in terms of the IMCs, now I still fervently believe this, that if you create a workspace where GPs can be left to do what they do best, which would be to manage complex patients, and you give them access to diagnostics, you give them access to therapies, you give them access to a whole range of wider determinants of health services, you provide long-term conditions to this, and you give them um, uh, access to some hospital consultants and hospital outpatients, that becomes a really attractive offer and it puts Thurrock in a really great position to attract new primary care staff. But uh, no one, not me, not Rahul, not anybody in the health service can force GPs to come and work in Thurrock. We're in a competitive market and we need to recognise that. Thank you, and obviously my concerns are is that you know, these new 2,000 um, spaces in Corinthian are going to go to obviously existing people, so people won't choose to come and work as new practice in Corinthian because there'll be no location for them. They'll have to buy a house down on the soils that was already a doctor's where it was before. It, it, I just, I'm really confused by it, sorry. Um, okay, it was uh, uh, Councillor Fish. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I put my hand up because um, I wanted to ask about how the aspiration in the primary care strategy about recruiting more GPs with these fantastic um, IMCs was coming along, but by the sound of it, no progress. <laughs> Councillor 
Clearly not. So, uh, if I may, if I, I think we've lost Rahul. If, uh, if I can respond. So, Rahul, you're breaking up. So, am I hearing now? Uh, very, very intermittent. So it seem to be my wife on them. I'm just going to try and switch off my video and see if that's yeah, more that's better. Than... Yeah, that's great. So probably, probably is the Wi-Fi not 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 fast enough. Um, so I may just try and answer that question um, from Councillor Fish around um, uh, the primary care strategy. The primary care strategy. Uh, looks at not only uh, recruiting, improving the recruitment rates for GPs, but also attracting, as Ian said, the wider mix of workforce within primary care. And and and, that, and I think we have to some extent a wider workforce. So in 2019, the first of April 2019, we had zero wider uh, skill mix force within primary care to. 1st of April 2021, we've got 22 additional whole time, full time, uh, additional skill mix force um, clinicians working within 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 our GP practices, and we have 19 positions recruited to within this year. So I think I think attracting um, the the skill mix within within uh, primary care remains a challenge, but nevertheless we are making some positive moves. As Ian has said, there is a concern around uh, where we are losing our GP partners to salaried GPs or locums, and I think that is where the focus needs to be: is how do we get more GP pa GP partners within the patch, so that we have we have a a balanced um, workforce with long-term commitment within Tharuk. Okay, thank you, Rahul. Uh, Councillor Piccolo. Well, I'll say Councillor Polly. Thank you, Chair. Um, the recruitment of GPs to Tharuk is not a new issue. Uh, going back 15 years or so, when there was a primary care trust in Tharuk, they even were going overseas to Spain and places of that ilk to try and recruit uh, GPs to the area. We, we've had massive growth in, in that time scale and it, it's a little bit sad to still be hearing the same uh, message that it is because Thurrock is not seen as a, a, a place of destination for the, the GPs that are qualifying. So um, my, my understanding, maybe incorrectly, was that um, the, the IMCs were to not just replace the clinics and the services that are currently be, being delivered from Orsit, um, it was to improve services because of the... And to free up Basildon as well from, you know, as an acute hospital, uh, for, for people to have to be referred by their GPs and... For, for blood tests because there's nowhere else that they can get a D-dimer done or, or things of that ilk. To be sending people to A&E for what could be dealt with at these IMCs, and, and that was my understanding why the transformation from health hubs to integrated medical centres. At no point did I ever have... Uh, in my mindset, that these we were building new GP surgeries for existing GPs to trans transcend from perhaps their older building, not fit for purpose building, into a four or five star facility. So I, I'm not quite sure where I've missed that transition. Uh, and that does give me a concern. Absolutely agree with Councillor Holloway. Um, 
uh, perfectly, with one, perfectly on Thames, with one of the biggest growth agendas um, in the borough. We, we've effectively a new town being built within its heart. Uh, for, for that to, to be suggesting that uh, there, there isn't any more GP provision is, is a major concern. I also have a concern on the design of these buildings and, and in particular some that are if they are delivering services that and clinics around cardiac and respiratory, so pulmonary cardio uh, clinics, there will be an unwell person in there somewhere. That they'll be going there because they've already got an underlying condition. You know what consideration is given to the emergency services that they might have to visit these centres and and pick patients up from them, transfer. So I just, and my other question is, is for Chris, if we can, um, net zero carbon. What do we mean by net zero carbon? Is it, car even the expression carbon neutral, I mean, it just sounds expensive to me, uh, I've got to say. I, I don't know if we could have any more meat on the bones, what net zero carbon means. Thank you. Can I just come in on that last point? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so since the report was written, things have moved on a little bit from net zero carbon. So net zero carbon is um, a new, or we think, let me say, um, we think will be a new requirement for all NHS buildings under NHS England's um, uh, sustainability rules. We haven't, uh, to answer your question honestly, um, I don't entirely know is the honest answer because the guidance hasn't been published. Um, we are not expecting the guidance until November. There was some question raised about whether um, the IMCs would have to meet this guidance. Uh, I've since, uh, along with colleagues, had meetings um, with uh, estate directors and senior people at NHS England, and we think we can actually get dispensation. Um, to try and answer your question, it's about trying to construct the building um, and actually the way the building operates, including how the staff travel to the building and how you heat and light the building, as well as the building for construction, um, such that there is no ultimate carbon footprint of the building. I think that is correct, but without actually being able to see the, the guidance because it hasn't been published yet, um, I, I can't give you a definitive answer. But we are um, uh, minded now to understand that, um, that this may not need to apply because we've started the design of these buildings before the NHS has actually published any guidance. And so it would be unreasonable. And I, I did push back quite hard so I felt it was unreasonable for the NHS to move the goalposts halfway through the design process. Um, so um, uh, we, I'm hopeful that certainly for Tilbury we can return to the um, original um, time scale of 2024. Thank you, Ian. Um, so was that going to be the same sort of point? Yeah, yeah j just on this net zero carbon um, issue. <clears throat> I noticed that uh, it's a requirement for Tilbury, which we're, we're sorting out. It's a requirement for Purfleet. I know you're saying at the moment there's no certainty about it, but in the report it says that Purfleet requires a um, net zero carbon approach because it's a new building. When, do we when we come to Grays, which is actually um, operated or uh, part owned and operated by um, NELFT um, and the CCG, uh, it's not going to be a new hot, a new centre anymore. It's going to be the reuse of 19 old buildings, which are nowhere near um, anything like approaching zero carbon efficiency. Um, it's absolutely atrocious that we're looking at reusing 30, 40 year old buildings, which are spread all over the place, and it's going to be the main centre of this new proposed 
medical hub scheme. Um, I just cannot accept that we do not do something and put in new building or new buildings there. Um, it, the, the cost of updating those buildings um, just for heating and everything else must be absolutely atrocious. If that's going to be the main centre and it's going to be the flagship of these new medical centres, you shouldn't be using and redeveloping, or well, not redeveloping, but making use of 40-year-old buildings. If that's going to be the, the, the prime what's name, it needs to be done properly and there needs to be a new building there. Joe, did you want to come in on that? I wasn't to give that point particularly. Okay, um, I, I mean, we on our site visit, uh, Council Holloway, we were shown plans for redevelopment of the site with all new buildings. I think, I think, Chair, there were some. There was a, a building that was that could have been used already. So it's a, a mixture of the both. I think, yes. Yeah, so there were some some buildings that could be used that that, that although forty years old, they actually weren't in. Definitely weren't in bad condition, but I do understand the, the councillor's point. I think, for me, it is just every every time we meet, it's more and more concerning. There's more things thrown at us about these that we are finding out each time. More hurdles, which is which is extremely difficult and upsetting for residents as well. Because I'm really mindful that we we are also the ones that are speaking to our residents about this, and when we are excited about it, and then also then have to tell them, oh, by the way, when we said. It was it was extra on top of, but now it's instead of. That looks that reflects badly on on all of us because obviously what we thought and what they thought is is very different and something that's positive and they were happy about. They're not so excited about now. Um, I think as well. What I, my concern is that I understand we have lots of new members on the committee and that I appreciate that this report will become welcome to them as as new members to understand this. But I have seen this same report now for a couple of years, and I'm sure, I don't know, Chair, the, the last meeting before the election does feel like an, an age ago, but I'm sure I said I just didn't want to keep seeing this. We don't even know what's going into all of the buildings. I know this was postponed because of COVID, and there, was, there had to be a committee to decide what the closure of Orsit, what was going into each. I want to see what's going into each of these. I think things new, need to move along now. And I want to see not this anymore. I want to see what's happening. I want to see movement. I want to see answers to these questions that we can present. I just don't want to see this report anymore. And with, with all due respect, Chris, is it Chris or Christopher? Sorry, uh, we weren't properly introduced. Are, are you from the CCG? or I We're used to seeing Mark, so I'm not sure. No, from the Council. I'm working on... Hi. Oh, right, OK. Sorry, because I didn't know where Mark was from the CCG, so I'm not sure who was presenting to us. So excuse my exasperation, but it's probably because there's just a lot of, of things being thrown at us. And yeah, like the chair and like other councillors in the chamber, I'm not happy about it. Um, with that said, I have put the uh, proposal to uh, Ian that we do set up an overview group of this. Um, I know that the uh, officers weren't very keen because the time scale uh, and what they could actually present if we were to meet uh, first of all I said to like give us an update to weekly but at least once a month for us to meet either virtually or physically because I think we need to really now be screwing you now putting the thumb screws on this to to get this right to, to see it um, so do we all agree to set up a, a working group on on this can we take a bit of a minute? Sorry, Chair. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm just, you know, we've seen this report every other month for two years exactly. and nothing has, has changed. I'm not sure if meeting each month will make a any difference whatsoever because we've asked each, every scrutiny meeting to come back with something different and an update. And it's that's never what been can't different. be accepted anymore, isn't it? We need to start having more information. If we just keep saying, you're presenting at HOSC whenever, we're just going to get the same generic stuff. We need to know what's happening in each stage now because it just seems to be, we get told the same thing, but underneath, everything seems to be changing. 
I think before setting up a, a group chair that, that we should get a, a, a timetable. And, and it is a respect thing, I think, from, from NHS colleagues, from the CCG, from, the, from Orsett Hospital. I'm so mindful that COVID is still ongoing. We are still in the midst of a yeah. pandemic. And that if the, if the work isn't done, then we need a time scale of when that work is going to be done because the ambition of 2024, 2025 yeah. doesn't seem realistic. I don't think that we should convene members each month if the reports and the work isn't just going to be done. I, I do understand that. Ian, you have a update each month, don't you? A report that you get? That you could do a brief on? I have a, a progress report. Sorry, I've got a lack of light. People need. I have a program board meeting every month that um, Mark Tebbs and I chair. We rotate the chair between us. Um, we actually had um, uh, the the um, this month's one this morning. Um, I, I, I no one is more frustrated than me about the progress or the, or the lack of progress in terms of some of these issues. So I, I feel and I understand your frustration because I feel it too. Um, just a, a few comments. These are the most, in 26 years of doing stuff like this, these are the most complex programmes I've ever worked on because of the huge number of interdependencies in terms of different organisations and the needs of different organisations. The NHS, as councillors will know, is not one homogenous thing. It's a whole selection of different trusts and CCGs and other structures, including NHS England. In terms of NHS England, that then breaks down in terms of different elements and um, the property elements. So it, it, it is enormously complicated. Um, if it was simple, we'd have done it by now. Uh, Councillor Holloway's comment is absolutely right. This has been caused by COVID because NHS and actually council colleagues' entire focus over the last 14 months has been on actually getting us through the pandemic and rightly so. Uh, and that focus still goes on, even though we see the numbers dropping. Um, the NHS has an enormous backlog in terms of things that haven't been picked up. Primary care is uh, facing unprecedented demand. There is unprecedented demand at the hospital now. So we are trying to restart a lot of that, this in the context um, uh, of COVID and the ongoing pressures of COVID. We do need to get to um, an agreed time scale. And I have asked the PMO to um, uh, provide that information to me as quickly as possible. What keeps happening is we keep getting thrown curved balls, the latest one being carbon net zero, which came entirely left field. And we had to ascertain actually what that meant and then whether we needed a complete redesign. And at one point it looked like we needed a complete redesign, at which point I pushed back very strongly and very aggressively. Um, and it looks like we've got that overturned. So, uh, yeah, you can set up a committee, but I can only I can only report what I can report, trying my hardest to push this forward. It, it's not going, if, if you think hauling officers into another committee is going to make it happen any quicker, then um, with respect, I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't agree. Um, but I'm very happy to provide continued and, and, um, and, and a regular updates in terms of where we've got to. And uh, I have asked for the time scale and a project plan for each of them with um, key milestones on. Um, I, I am really gripping this, having taken it over three months ago. Um, and we need to hold ourselves as um, officers and elements of the NHS to account against those, those agreed time scales. Um, so I hope that gives you at least some assurance Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, as a, not as a compromise, but as an agreement, could we have an update after your meeting every month, the monthly meeting you have, could you do a briefing note for us that's emailed to us that we could go through so we can keep on track with you up to speed what is going on? Sure, I'm very, 
I'm very happy to do that. And I, what I can try and do in that briefing note is identify what has progressed since the last meeting to try and give you some assurance that we are pushing it. I do get your frustration. I really do. And I feel it too. And I'm determined that we will hold each other to account and we will push forward with these. Thank you, Ian. Well, thank you for your doing. Uh, Councillor Holloway. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Really appreciate it. I think that's a, a fantastic idea because I think that it's the communication and seeing where the movement is. Can I just suggest that possibly adding, you know, as strong as Ian, I know that, you know, if anyone can do it, Ian can, that we add our member voice to that and you as chair, maybe in combined with, with Councillor Mays, write a letter to formalise our request. I'm happy to add my name to it as the, as the shadow portfolio and vice, vice chair to, to just say we want to timescale. We're mindful of COVID. We know it's ongoing. We understand the backlog, etc. But we really need to know because at this point we don't we can't believe that these are going to be delivered in the time scale just to know when they're going to restart planning when these things are going to be in place decisions about this are going to be put into place i think it is fair to ask for a time scale at least and have our weight behind that brilliant yeah i think that's a fantastic idea we'll get that, that done uh, uh thank you very much chair um could i also uh, suggest that in that letter when we're uh, that we reinforce the council's position on the memorandum of understanding that the facilities that are provided at Orsit do not close or be removed until all of these alternative uh, venues are up and running and staffed we we don't want to be in a situation where there is a building in Rowley Road and all the clinics have disappeared because they were going to be placed in intimate, uh, integrated medical centres. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, un under uh, previous chairmanship, it is was something we were really keen on, on emphasising that no services will be removed and we definitely can add that alongside that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, <laughs> thank you, Tanya. I, I know you didn't get to speak. Are you still on mute? Can you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you need to do sign language. It's like... <laughs> I, I, think, I think she's doing it purposely, Chair. <laughs> yeah. <rude. laughs> she doesn't want to talk so to me. She me to answer all the questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all. my glasses back on I can actually see okay um, so do, first of all before moving on do we agree that that we're going to happy to have that um, an update for me and monthly with that in it brilliant and Victoria I'll contact you regarding getting Alan and that onto the letter okay item nine what program I'm sorry I'm oh, sorry sorry no. Would you like a perspective from the disabled people's point of view that we talk to about these buildings? Is that useful? Just just a couple of comments. Do you know, any information you can give from that point of view <laughs> is brilliant. <laughs> is that all right? Um, so there's a couple of things, really. We were remembering, and no disrespect to the officers here, that we think it was about 12 or 13 years ago, we were in a room worrying about the GP future of Thurrock. And someone with a learning disability reminded me today that one of their suggestions was we have very intelligent young people in Thurrock, and their suggestion was that the CCG sponsor them to go to university to become doctors and agree to stay in Thurrock for three years once they qualify. And at the time, it was laughed at. And sitting here tonight, I suddenly I remember this young man saying this to me and thinking, is that such a crazy idea? Because there's something about these shiny buildings for us that's quite dangerous because they're really beautiful and shiny and amazing. But the long term needs to be looked at and because it's about what's going to... If I'm here in 10 years' time, God willing, you know, to sit here and hear, oh, well, this is still an issue, would be terrible, wouldn't it, for the people of Thorough? I'm not a politician, you know, don't get me wrong. But the reality for us is that... If you're a woman with a learning disability in Thurrock, you still die 13 years younger than your counterpart, nothing to do with your learning disability. It's the same across the country, and we've worked very hard with the CCG and others to help that. But fundamentally, there are health services that are required. 
And part of that, also the other thinking that was going on today, is G are GPs the answer? Maybe we don't need GPs, and maybe there's something else. Everyone that we support in Thurrock will tell you their pharmacy is the place they go for medical advice because they get great answers and great support. So that's really interesting. So is there something, I don't know what that would be, a different model? And the other side of it was within the buildings, we, were, we went to look at the, the designs of the Perfleet one today because there was a consultation, and, and we were talking to them about 5G because you've seen tonight, internet's a problem. But the truth is, in the medical future, you might be at home with your diabetes stuff on and suddenly, you know, a self-driving car will come to pick you up to take you to Basildon because you're unwell because it's monitoring you. I mean, complete fantasy, but it could happen. But there's something about the patients having the power to control them, their own medicine that then links back to these buildings. And so the, the joke today was, with some of the disabled people, was why don't they put a massive, great 5G aerial on each building and health could probably charge O2 or someone a fortune to, to rent it. But the reality is that would give the local community the access straight back to that centre in the modern way, which would really help because the, the kits out there that can do that. On the practical side, the design of the buildings looks really uh, acceptable. What we're pleading for is that there are changing spaces built into each one, and that's something that, that, that they said they're willing to sign up to, so that our friends that need particular facilities to get themselves comfortable to be changed in the loose, they'll be built into there, which would be really, really good. And the acoustics and signage could be fantastic. But if these integrated medical centres are going to be in the heart of the community, then having things like Thurrock Adult Community College run services out there, having the community in there will be really great. But it's about the long-term vision for what the medical support is that we need there that needs to be put into the plans. That's, that, that was our feedback. Thank you, Neil. Um, great point of view. I mean, yeah, medical is, is moving on. You know, you've got doctors doing stuff from abroad and the operations from abroad, you know, so definitely that, that is something that needs to be considered and uh, we'll take that on board. Um, when it comes to the 5G thing, um, there is a, a, a journalist sitting right behind you who probably love the fact that you just um, to put 5G on top of <laughs> it perfectly. Um, but yeah, definitely valid points, and thank you for, for that input. Okay, item 9, work programme. This can be found on pages 39 to 40. Okay, scrutiny review will be undertaken this year to look into how improve scrutiny functions and encourage members of overview and scrutiny committees to take a long view approach to their work programmes and potentially select a topic to investigate and develop across the year so it can be used to demonstrate measurable outcomes of the year's work. Also, as part of the review, we'll be looking to reduce the number of, of two-note reports and introduce a new briefing note system where directors will decide if a full report is needed to simplify a, uh, a briefing note. These briefing notes will be shared with members outside the meeting and members will have the opportunity to ask questions at the meeting, which can be done under the new standing agenda item entitled Agreement of Briefing Notes. Uh, I, I think that's a, a much more simpler version of what we're, you know, hopefully the end to our long, long, long meetings that we can actually focus more. I love the idea of the being accountable and measurable of our objectives. I think that's great. Um, topics, I think we've got a number of topics we can look at to, to cover that we can look at from mental health to reducing um, the length of, of time people at the moment spend on hold to doctors and not getting face-to-face -face appointments with doctors. There, there's a, a, a lot of issues we can put our heads together to come up with to select a topic, and maybe we can do that um, outside the meeting uh, between us to work out a, a topic on that. Does anyone else have a particular view on that? Uh, Councillor Fish. Just that I noticed from the uh, published uh, work programme <clears throat> in November, there's an item on the whole systems obesity strategy, yeah. which I think given that uh, <clears throat> it's recognised as um, something that can really uh, exacerbate COVID, um, I think it's um, an area that is really important. Um, was there a, I, I wasn't involved um, last year on the committee, so was there a particular reason for introducing that? Um, actually, I can pass that to uh, Councillor Holloway. Um, the original poll, I believe, was due to come back, is that correct, uh, Councillor Holloway? Um, do you know what, I, uh, that's an excellent question. I actually can't, I can't remember, it's one, <laughs> it's one for Ian. Th this report has, has come back a couple of, has it come back a couple of times? 
yeah, it'll have to be Pastor Ian or or um, or, or Jenny because I can't I can't remember the original. Apart from obviously being, you know, obesity amongst others, we are you know it is a, is a, an yeah. issue in Thurrock alongside smoking um, and, and lung cancer and, and others. Yeah. I think Ian does have his hand up actually, so I'm gonna hand over. Um, okay. <laughs> Trying to remember exactly what's come back when, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, the original strategy came to committee, I believe, or if not committee, it certainly came to Health and Wellbeing Board. And I think we brought one update back. The work has largely paused again over the last 14 months for exactly the same reason that the IMCs have, because everyone's um, uh, response has been around COVID and pretty much the entire public health team were quite rightly, I, I redeployed them all into fighting the pandemic. So, uh, you know, all of the commission programmes caused, we couldn't run weight management because of COVID restrictions. Um, and we are starting to restart those again. So I'd recommend if you want to report back that you just give us some time, we'll give Joe some time now to um, get the programmes back up and running. Otherwise, you're going to have another report that doesn't say very much other than the fact that you've restarted. And I think what you might want to know is, is actually what's been the, been the impact. So I, I, it seems to me for them there's quite a good time scale for that. But Joe, I don't know whether you want to come in. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Ian. Um, we are recruiting someone to revitalise and lead the whole system's obesity work. We've um, offered a online post yet so I think by the time we get that um, work going we're also working with the CVS and so a lot of the engagement around whole systems obesity just just stopped as Ian said so so there's quite a few things to get going so I would think that November would actually be a good time to come back and present to you um, what we do what we've managed to do over the previous few months just in, in terms of the broader point on impact of COVID. We are doing a piece of work uh, to look at what the impact of COVID has been across a very broad set of health and wellbeing indicators. So that, that work will be underway over the next six months as well. So we'll be able to update you on that at a later point in the year, Tim. Thank you, Joe. Um, I do actually remember it coming up now because I do remember I asked about a recommendation to reduce the number of takeaways that are allowed to open up within streets and test centres. Uh, Councillor Holloway, did you want to come back in on that? Yes, thank you. Just on the point with regards to the recommendations around briefings and new ways of working, very much welcome, as you do, Chair, the measurable outcomes, um, which is helpful. I do think, though, that health scrutiny is a bit different to some of the other committees in that a lot of it is um, NHS and CCG. So we don't actually have a lot of um, say in, in what's happening. So we do get an increased number of reports to note and comment, but that doesn't mean that they're not important and we shouldn't be aware of them. So whilst I understand the point that we should reduce the number of those reports, there sometimes actually we do need to see them and there is no more than we, that we just we really need to know so I just want to be mindful for that for our committee specifically and happy to um, talk offline about a topic that we might take up and then the one thing that I would um, like to add on to the agenda mindful that Joe just mentioned about all the and Ian about things starting up again was the um, update with regards to the sexual violence JSNA that work that happened last year and there was a an event last February we, where we hosted a number of organisations and it would just be really good. I know that there has been, I have had an update, but um, informally, but I think it would be good for the committee to see that work. And although a lot won't have been done again because of COVID, I just want to make sure that we're, we are, we are moving forward. So if we can add that as well on Jenny. Yeah, I think that'd be great if that could be added on there, Jenny. Um, so if I'd just like to throw open uh, to us as a bit of the work programme. Um, we are getting, and I know Ian and everyone is getting a lot of complaints regarding rates of doctor surgeries at the moment about people not getting it. Would we like to call in the CCG to sit in with a hospital with us to go over the complaints, well, not the complaints, but the delays within the doctor surgeries at the moment and the hold up and try and get all that back online, lack of face to face appointments still, people waiting two and a half hours on, online? to speak to a doctor. Do you agree on bringing that, Jill? Uh, 
sorry, Chair. Yeah, I, I definitely do think that it's a hot potato throughout the whole of the borough. I, and, and as Neil quite rightly said earlier, um, I think during this pandemic, the absenteeism of our GP surgeries has, has had a, a double-edged uh, effect in that we are starting to look at pharmacists and other healthcare professionals for for uh, support because we've had to, and they've mocked up a, a lot of uh, areas that the GP have, have been yeah. very lacking in, and. I, I also am aware that uh, when healthcare professionals should have a hotline into each GP surgery, that if they so if the district nurses, if the palliative care teams, if they're out in the community and they need to have access to GPs quickly, um, a lot a lot of the surgeries are not providing these lines now, or or those lines are being taken over so it's not just the public facing side of it that are, have not been able to access the GPs their actual counterparts that are out there in the community trying to deal with their absenteeism are also unable we, we you will have ambulances sitting on scene with families because they for an hour and a half because they also can't get through to a GP and, and I think that is something that we really do need to to find out what is it telephony systems that are at fault? Is, is, uh, what is it? So I, I would welcome that, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, it's Councillor Holloway, then Councillor Sammons. Thank you. I was hoping, Chair, if we could actually broaden it out to be a, a wider topic on um, skills mix and primary care within kind of a GP surgery setting, including pharmacies, including mm. nurses. Um, you know, prescribing, uh, you know, higher, higher qualified prescribing staff that can be in GP surgeries, because from my point of view, I just, I just don't think that going to a GP, going to a GP to, to get everything solved is actually working. And obviously, as part of the primary care strategy, it's that we should go to our pharmacist first, and then we should, you know, do what they say. And then do we need a nurse? Do we need a physio? So, Think of all, you know. Think about what care we need, and go to the the relevant um, team member, as opposed to just always going to to the GP. So, looking at that, the, you know, obviously the the issue with GPs, but in a wider, you know, the whole primary care, the whole service, and looking at skills mix and what we're doing to encourage that whole range into Thurrock, not just GPs. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Summers. Yeah, I personally get lots of complaints from people that try to call the GPs because obviously most GP surgeries you have to ring at eight to get a call. I understand that lots of surgeries are still seeing people, but to sort of wait for the whole day for a call from the GP who then speaks to you and says, oh, yeah, you need to come in tomorrow. I think we need to get back to the system where you just ring and get an appointment rather than hanging around all day. Because if you're waiting for the doctor to ring you on your mobile, and I myself have had this recently, and you're, you've got to go somewhere where you haven't got that great a reception and you miss that call, then that's done for the day. You've lost your slot. Whereas if you had an appointment at whatever time, you'd be making sure you got to it. And lots of people have great difficulty at 8 o'clock trying to get through the doctors when they're maybe getting their children to school, etc. I think a lot of residents are getting quite frustrated with this system where you've, you've now got to speak to the doctor before you can actually get an appointment. I understand that they can then prioritise, but many residents are really unhappy with this system. Yeah, um, as I say, just because obviously we're moving on, we've got a time scale. Um, we'd like to bring a report back from the CCG on that, if that's okay. Jenny, you can bring that in. Yeah, onto the work programme. 
Um, so we're literally just coming to the end of the meeting. And I've lost my script. There you go. <laughs> Right, so that, that this concludes the business of the meeting for the evening. I declare the meeting now closed at 9.28. Thank you all. Good evening.